Okay, if we could please stand for the break. <laughs> Almighty God, we acknowledge that we have a responsibility to look after your creation, especially this region we call Barcaldon Regional Council. We are conscious that our decisions are going to affect deeply the people we have come here to serve. Assist us to exercise respect for councillors, staff, and for the people of our region. Help us in this meeting to act wisely, justly, and intelligently in all our deliberations. Thank you, Lord, for the privilege of both leading and serving, and assist us to do these well. Amen. 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 Councillors, we have um, condolences this month for Mr. Ty Bojack of Aramac and Mr. Paul Arthur of Barcourt. Are there any further? We can please observe a moment of silence. Owners of the land upon which we meet today, uh, and the further broader region of the Buckhall and Regional Council and their elders, both past, present, and emerging. I call now for declarations of prescribed conflict of interest, Council of Beckles. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I don't think I have one. Councillor Leeson. I don't believe so. Councillor Leeson. Councillor Leeson. Councillor Leeson. Does any councillor present believe any other councillor may have overlooked a prescribed conflict of interest? Declaration of declarable conflict of interest. Councillor Beckham? No. Councillor Gleeson? No. Hanson? Yeah, I do, Mr. Mayor. In 3.8.3, the um, Sargon Mahogany Court, which is the previous one, and I'll address that while leaving the way. Thank you very much, Councillor. Councillor Arthur? No, no, Mr. Mayor. No, Mr. Mayor. Yes, Mr. Mayor, I have made just the previous one clerical conflict of interest in 3.4.2 progress project progress report and also 3.3.5 the operation. Um because of the sculpture trail, those those um reports mentioned work work that's been done. So I would like to participate as previous knowledge that my fellow councillors must determine that. Councillor, the standing uh, situation for Councillor Rogers is that we have uh, determined that the councillor may remain in the room. Is there any councillor present who wishes to move a change to the status quo? That being the case, Councillor Rogers will remain in the room as has been previously allowed. However, should the situation change, um, obviously there's a very clear understanding from Councillor Rogers about her declaration of interest and if in any other point there's a conversation at the Sculpture Trail, please warn Councillor Rogers if you believe it may interfere with her or intersect with her conflict of interest. Does any Councillor present believe any other Councillor present may have overlooked a declarable conflict of interest? In the case, we move forward to the confirmation of minutes. Can I say <coughs> Excuse me, somebody please move the 11 October minutes to be received. Councillor Plum, Councillor Hanson seconds. 
as in favour. Carried, 7 0. Any alterations? Amendments or errors? <coughs> I have a resolution to confirm those minutes, please. Councillor Gleeson moves, seconded Councillor Arthur. Those in favour? 7 0. Does any officer or councillor present have a petition in the correct door? Being none, reports 3 2 1. Can I have somebody please move my information report to the seat? Councillor Arthur, seconded Councillor Plum. Questions? So Mr. Mayor, I'm just wondering how the office plans are going moving forward. Um, so that meeting um, that's referenced there with Jason was more of a structural meeting about what's possible, what would be required, looking at things like heritage listing because this whole complex is heritage listed. Um, there's no architectural design where we're, we're going to meet with an architect um, to discuss some options next week when we're in Brisbane uh, that Jason recommended. He's done some work uh, in both Winton and Roma recently um, and so it's a no commitment chat, just a bit of a chat to work it out. So yeah, Jason came over and had a look at a few things with us but it was really just a bit of an advice chat. So having that building um, images listed, does that um, relieve us of some funds that we have to put into it, or do we have no. it? it's an all, all cost to us? No, it's going to be all our costs, it just makes it harder to do anything more expensive. Thank you. Well, can I also ask about the, um, the uh, Tasmanian trip for the roads? <coughs> Local road community infrastructure program. We're looking to see the new guidelines for round phase three of that, um, probably into the new year before they hand them down, or maybe later this year. But it didn't sound like it was going to be imminent. Um, a very clear focus outlined by both the assistant minister for infrastructure and roads, Carol Senator Carol Brown, and. The departmental staff from the Department of Infrastructure that the clear focus will be on roads. Um, not to the exclusion of all other projects, but certainly a very clear focus on, on that investment. Um, there was uh, some <coughs> consideration to, so there was a couple of breakout elements. Um, Chris obviously attended with me and so did uh, Councillor Arthur, and in those breakout sessions, we looked at things like heavy vehicle access, um, what the future of heavy vehicle access looks like. It, it, it probably that was so that was the session that I attended. It doesn't actually really look like expanding the network for bigger configurations too much more. Um, there's a system that's being trialled in New South Wales called PBS, um, which is a performance based system. Um, they're using innovation and technology to improve trailers oversized configurations to grant them access to areas which currently they don't. So that was a little bit of an insight into what an expansion of our road network could look like or what expansion of access could look like. And there was also some sessions about road management from an NHVR approvals process. So ALGA has fought for and retained local government's right to be the road manager for the purpose of issuing permits uh, on our local road network for over mass over width. Um, Vehicles, which is, which is a, as the um, president of Alga said, sometimes the biggest wins are just retaining the rights that you already have. Um, so yeah, there was some, some value there. There was also uh, a number of sessions, but conversations around road safety targets. Um, and the National Road Safety <coughs> Plan has uh, a target to halve the road fatalities and serious incident rate by 2030. 2030, 2031, sorry, it was signed off last year, so it's a 10 year strategy. Um, a little bit frustrating, um, they broke, they break for statistical purposes Australia into three zones. There's urban, regional and rural and remote, and by the definition that they use at that level, we, we fit in the regional bucket. Uh, the death rates are a bit alarming when you see them broken up over those cohorts, so they do it on per 100,000 capita, how many people are 
killed uh, at the genesis. So the data collection point was 2019, and the strategy was signed off in 2021 with targets for reduction by 2031. Uh, the, the death rate per capita in uh, urban centres uh, in 2019 was 2.2 per 100,000, so their target is effectively one, to, to not exceed one per 100,000. Uh, it's um, a little over 10, not quite 11, in regional areas is what it was in 2019, and it's a little over 22, not quite 23 per 100,000 in rural remote. So halving each of those cohorts still delivers a really uh, unhealthy margin towards the fatality rate outside of metropolitan centres. And uh, a number of Queensland mayors have attended and delegates and ourselves had a chat around that perhaps they're using the wrong matrix to determine what the target setting should be. Um, a 50% reduction in urban Queensland is quite good, although there are millions there, whereas there are not here. Um, so we're just having a discussion, um, a few of us with LGAQ around what we can do to perhaps analyse, because that target, the targets, the aspirational targets are the, are the official policy positions of state and federal governments to determine then road funding programs. So we think, those of us in regional Queensland anyway, that there perhaps might need to be a more heightened understanding of the issues that are causing the fatalities in regional Queensland and perhaps don't reallocate funding away from Metro because it's important for them as well, but some additional funding to perhaps lower by more than 50% so that we can try and compete on a relatively equal basis and value a human life the same west of Bark Calden as we do east of Ipswich. Um, I'm not suggesting that it's an intentional slight on rural and regional, um, but I don't think the data is well presented and I don't think it tells the story around what governments should or should not be doing in terms of ensuring road safety outcomes <coughs> comprehensively across the country, irrespective of whether you're located in a major regional centre or a major capital city or a really remote western Queensland town. So um, that was from an, ad, an ongoing advocacy point of view, that was one of the considerable takeouts that uh, a number of mayors and I, and you know, certainly our delegates, had a long discussion one afternoon um, with respect to the validity <coughs> of that data. And we'll continue to play a role uh, in analysing our ability to leverage that through our regional roads group, um, the first meeting of which is next week, the first meeting post Hobart, which is next week. Um, I also had the opportunity, um, as it's met down there, as a yeah. separate. Before you move on to your next subject, can I just ask for some clarification? Did you yeah. say 22 per 100,000 in rural? Correct. Just a little bit over, actually. And that data is collected over what time frame? Uh, a 12 month period. Just a 12 month period? Yeah. Pretty high, yeah? Yeah, so, so bear in mind it's an extrapolated figure in that. There's not always 100,000 people live in a rural remote, so they, they, they look at, they band the councils together yep. Australia-wide that live in, the, or that they believe are categorised as that. So um, there's only 70 out of the 577 LGAs that are classified as rural remote. That's why we are in the regional bucket, because if you're talking, you know, a lot of um, remote northern councils a lot in Western Australia, a few very large local government land councils in New Northern Territory, obviously the Channel Country in Queensland, Western New South Wales, really sparsely populated um, remote LGAs. Um, effectively in Queensland you'd sort of look at Witten North and West is the entry of regional Queensland coming this way or the exit of it. Um, but yeah, it is high, it's alarming. Obviously the gross numbers <coughs> still the gross actual numbers still heavily yeah. weighted towards capital cities, but their matrix is to analyse it on per 100,000 capita. That's their matrix, not mine, and it shows the data very clearly that you're 11 times more likely to be fatally injured in a road accident out here than you are in, or west of here than you are in Brisbane, or 
five times more likely in the Buckhorn Council area than you are in, in yeah. councils of our type. Sorry, it's not specific to an LGA, but that's the data. Do they have data to what is causing the majority of these accidents? Um, they do. <coughs> yeah, I can talk to you a little bit yeah. about that. I just have to pluck three, uh, the three categories that they uh, looked at were um, uh, rules they put into uh, sort of legal activities. So effects of um, uh, so drugs, sorry, yep. uh, drugs and alcohol. Yep. Um, then there were um, uh, sort of who type behaviour, uh, and the last category was system. Uh, so system incorporates um, vehicle and uh, transport infrastructure, so roads and vehicles themselves. Um, of the so, and then, then we looked at two particular columns, one being fatalities <coughs> and the other being um, um, injury. Now, that would take, that would include for me everything from um, uh, any, in, in any incident where someone has uh, been treated and taken to hospital, uh, either for observations uh, or for broken bones, that, that sits in that. Um, so that's broad, um, but the fatality is obviously, it's, it's black and white. Um, of which, um, of fatalities, 78% were attributed to a system being vehicle uh, or infrastructure. Uh, for broken bones, uh, the, well, the other category, broken bones, observation and the like, where someone is reported to a hospital, that was about 58%. Um, what, was, what sticks out to me was that the, um, uh, the drug and alcohol <coughs> um, were in, in both categories, um, uh, yeah, sort of, I, I would have to, I think it was something around around 12 and, and 10 percent, um, which is which is quite insignificant compared to compared to, to the total figures. Yeah, yeah. Again, roughly, uh, but the two figures that do stick out to me were the fatalities uh, and the broken bones, um, being 78 and 56 percent, I think. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> so. Um, an interesting intersect into this, obviously, is that there was a significant focus on road safety at the conference, and uh, was a key takeout uh, for for me personally, along with some other uh, probably not as serious issues. And it will be an interesting segue then into a meeting of our um, uh, technical group as a as a working group from our community roundtable on safety that's meeting this Friday. So representatives of QPS. Um, Department of Transport and Main Roads and our, and our work staff <coughs> will be meeting to discuss road safety issues, some of which were raised during our community forum, such as the entrance to speed zones and in and around towns, um, blind spots, um, uh, road safety condition reporting during wet weather. Um, that, so there's a number of issues that allows us at a local government level in partnership with, with two other state agencies to deliver um, both engineering solutions but also potentially road safety initiatives that can help lower that because we have a role to play as well i mean uh, it's not just simply putting our hand out for funding there's certainly things that we can do there's funding already available that we need to target and use better uh, and also be the conduit for community concerns around you know issues such as car parking at the iga and pedestrian access um, uh, school children commuter <laughs> access is that alpha, that alpha area? Would that yeah. sort of come into that as well? Yeah, everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. Some answers on that alpha. Yeah, none of these things happen in five minutes. Like it'll be a number of meetings, a number of solutions, because if they have the instant to have any success on in an approach like this, you have to take all of the agencies along with <coughs> the right so they'll all want to do their due diligence, then report back, have a look how it affects their strategy, but at least they're at the table. We've got a group now at the table talking. Um, Councillor Arthur, would you like to add anything with uh, respect to the conference? Yeah, the breakout session I went to was about recyclable material for use in roads and civil construction. Uh, it touched on tyres and concrete, but it was predominantly the use of crushed glass as an aggregate. <coughs> Unfortunately for our part of the world, the, the technology is not at a stage where it's small enough or cost effective to be portable and the, the quantum of material required um, 
and you've said previously on the subject, we think we've got a lot of tyres or broken concrete or glass, um, but compared to metropolitan areas, we've got nothing. Uh, so unfortunately at this stage it's financially unsustainable <coughs> to, to do too much in the space with the current technology, but I think the thought is that over time it could progress to where it basically sits in a shipping container so you can put it on a truck, take it to wherever, run your tyres through it, run your crushed glass. I would have thought that the majority of the glass out in this part of the world goes through containers for change as it is, so there's probably not a lot of that uh, surplus. And it would be interesting to see the value of a, a 10 cent bottle as to what it equates to in, in a broken aggregate by the time it's processed. Yeah. Um, but no, the, the second day was, uh, I think there was more takeaways out of it. Uh, a lot of high level stuff the first day. Um, some interesting stuff about the LRCIP program. Um, but yeah. <coughs> the other, um, uh, I guess it was a promotional tool, but it was really informative and something that I'd urge you all to think of uh, in terms of both policy setting, but also understanding how the world is going to move very quickly in this space is uh, electronic vehicles and mm -hmm. hydrogen powered vehicles. Yeah. Um, the, the, it's not a matter of, uh, and this is not a, I'm not looking to cause an argument with this, it's not a matter of if that technology is going to be rolled out or when it's developed, it may come, it's already there. It's sitting ready to go. Um, the the uh, capacity of hydrogen fuels um, vehicles to replace uh, things like trains, heavy road trains, um, is there. It's simply the, 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 the presentation that you touched on, like bulk shipping. Yeah, bulk shipping. Which I thought yeah. was. Yeah. The, the availability of fuel cells, either electronic vehicle charging stations or um, quantities of hydrogen uh, is the only thing that's stopping it being rolled out tomorrow. It, it, it is done. The technology is locked, and sealed, delivered. Um, it, it, it will be markedly quicker. We all hear this said, oh, you know, it'll never <coughs> take over in regional Queensland. And this, yeah, it's within a decade, will be a massive player, both in terms of what council needs to consider for its own fleet requirements. Uh, what it needs to consider in terms of the infrastructure requirements to service our um, ratepayers and visitors to the region, uh, but also in what we need to do with the <coughs> um, Because you talk about waste and recycling, um, there's going to be a whole bunch of obsolete cars um, very quickly. Just a side spin off uh, that's something that I don't yet know what the um, ramifications will be and engineers are going to have to consider this and certainly our old salty grader drivers will as well. Um, one kilogram of hydrogen fuel cell, fuel, sorry, as it's burnt through up, or as it's used, because it's not burnt, it's not combustion, um, as it's utilised to create mo momentum in a, in a vehicle, generates seven litres of pure water up the exhaust is discharged uh, effectively into the environment. So thinking about that, I don't know how far one kilogram gets you and it would depend on whether you're driving a four wheel drive as opposed to a road train, as you know, but you think of all the water, like so of all the cars driving on the road today, discharging water onto the surface. So what does that do to road safety in terms of in paved areas, but then also in, in unsealed road networks? Is it a positive, is it a negative, is there a, is there something to be harnessed? And, and so, um, indeed, they also, the electronic vehicles are undertaking uh, air purification as part of their process because they require that. So, the, 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 the need to really actively have people engaged in the EV slash hydrogen space, and it, and it probably will be, um, this, now this is an assessment from I think hydrogen will probably present more solutions because of the capacity for it to do heavy lifting um, a lot more readily than EVs. Um, but the, the capacity for that, we, we're really going to need to actively consider um, things like hydrogen fuel stations, locations, uh -huh. 
including the you know, um, how do we incorporate that into our depots, into our truck fleets, and that that's all going to be within you know, I say a decade. Um, it could be substantially faster than that. Yeah. Chris, I totally agree. Um, they're absolutely convinced the other way. It's, it's coming. Mr. Mayor, one thing that probably I take out of that is that a future council would have to be aware of um, not being left with a big one of obsolete vehicles. Yeah, it's um, uh, it, it, it's a real game, a real game changer in that um, that fleet uh, management space, um, and um, how councils are going to adapt to, to that is, is probably something that we need to be considering sooner rather than later. Um, but um, you know, consideration around expertise. Um, subject matter experts uh, in, in terms of how we how we do that. Um, I can't even I can't even get my head around it at the moment. Um, so new is, is the concept and I think the challenges that we're going to face. Um, but they are not insignificant. I think I thought about that exactly shit on the plane on the way home about the 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 <coughs> legacy effect of obsolete plan. Uh, I'd suggest so as as Keen and it's not keen, but it's obviously eyes wide open that I am to vehicles and trucks. I think we'll find uh, earth moving equipment a little bit slower to the party um, for a number of reasons. But one, the, the compliance issues for off road vehicles are substantially smaller um, mm. at this stage. But for certainly things like four wheel drives, youths, cars, trucks, this will be rapid. Um, we, as part of our asset management plans and fleet plan replacement, may need to actively consider shortening the period of time that we retain fleet for so that we can be closer to the front of the curve than the back. So that if this technology is rolled out quicker than we expect, we have the capacity to step out of a relatively new, where there's still potentially a market for a trade, and into the into the new before we're left with trying to trade eight, nine, ten year old trucks at the at, at a time when nobody wants an internal combustion engine, if you know what I mean. Mm. So the other thing that was part of that Hyundai presentation uh, was uh, that Euro 6 will become law in Australia from 2024 five financial year. Yeah. Um, so that's 18 months away. Now Euro 6 is a, is a pretty advanced um, emissions control standard for heavy vehicles. Uh, there are already trucks in Australia running Euro 6 compliance, but not many of them in big trucks, mainly in rigids. Um, so that means, once again, when you look at our fleet replacement strategy, we will need to be very cognizant of what we have moving in and around that era because of the... the so there's no need when emissions control standards change, you don't need to retrofit them to or retrospectively apply that to vehicles you already own. It just means that new vehicles from that date forward have to be compliant before they're sold. But that said, it's, a, it's definitely going to be a trick for us to manage that as well because with it comes a whole new, for example, UD trucks that are in Australia, rigids that are in Australia already have all three, they have um, all three methods of um, emissions control that are applied sometimes individually to a truck is the only way they can compare to that. <coughs> AdBlue, EGR, and DPF. So they have a, a carbon storage, they burn urea, and they have supercharging through their EGR. Um, now that delivers significant uh, horsepower reduction. So once again, fit for purpose. You know, our dri a driver's sink at the moment of 450 horsepower UD is sufficient for a body and dog operation. But you go and whack all that other stuff that's currently not on the motor, and see the reduction in performance that's applied. So understanding what our needs are and what impact uh, emission reduction technology has on that just forms part of this really complicated matrix that you're worried about existing technology being <coughs> retarded on the front end and new technology very quickly consuming it or innovation consuming it from behind and, and in that I mean EV <coughs> um, hydrogen production. So yeah, it's really <coughs> that little session we also it was in the sponsors thing yeah. you know, at conference you have a sponsors brief in the 15 minutes before each thing and you 90% of people stand up and walk out with it on on so <coughs> we did not because even though Hyundai ran it they also touched on what every other company in that space like Kenworth um what's the um 
forklift company, the biggest forklift company in the world. Toyota um, are doing in this space. I mean, and Toyota as a car company have they stated that <coughs> here uh, during the Western Queensland Local Government Conference here in 2018. They that their company's corporate position is there will be no internal combustion motors produced by Toyota by 2035. Yeah, that seemed like a long time ago in 2018, but now in 2022, 2035 is not that far away. There will not be an internal combustion motor produced by Toyota <coughs> by 2035. Maybe, Mr. Mayor, we should be looking at something <coughs> up here in one or two or three of our depots and trialling it, you know, uh, some vehicles or something ourselves anyway. Getting Electronic vehicles is probably the only thing we can really try yet, like hydrogen's still some distance away, but when it arrives, it'll arrive in a bank. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but definitely, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to really tease this out and get some, as Chris said, some subject matter experts about whether we're going to get at a point where we can sophisticate, whether we and the technology is sophisticated enough to trial it and whether the cost is worth it. But some really exciting, but yet confronting issues there that we're going to have to deal with that probably isn't something most people, when they hear of EV roll out, they don't think of fleet <coughs> in a small local council, but it will be. Do a trial with or something. <coughs> well, there's a lot of councils in urban settings right now. Yeah. Yeah. Mr. Mayor, um, they talk at all about converting the you know, fuel, diesel, or petrol over to hydrogen. Is there a possibility of doing that? Or? Uh, they didn't talk about it, and my feeling for two reasons they won't do that is um, uh, one, they won't make as much money, <laughs> but secondly, <laughs> hydrogen. And it, it, hydrogen and electric technology works substantially different on it on different principles. There's no pistons and <coughs> like they're not. They just don't work on the same methodology. Um, hydrogen is combined with oxygen to create kinetic energy, which then drives <coughs> the motor. Um, hence, the byproduct being water. Hydrogen, oxygen create water. Um, and you've got to the end of my technical knowledge, but the, they did put a number of schematics of how the motors work um, up during the presentation, and they in no way resembled anything I've ever seen like an internal combustion motor. So I, I would think the only way you could convert it is to take the frame of a car that you really like the look of, strip all of the electronics out, put a hydrogen motor in. So wouldn't say conversion's not possible, but is it economically feasible? Probably not. <coughs> Yeah, just it maybe talking about that water future, maybe graders and water their own as they go along. Yeah, ironically. Well, I, I actually suspect that um, uh, in in the future, and just having a look at the design now, a lot of these a lot of these vehicles mm -hmm. are you, you've got these these cells that are built into uh, into your chassis rail. I don't think it's inconceivable in the future that as one particular cell dies. Um, you know, the rest of the rest of the vehicle is still you know, fit for purpose. <coughs> Literally flipping it over and like you do with a remote control, you're removing one one battery and, and replacing it again. So I think that's going to be a challenge for um, for, for manufacturers as well. Is um, you know, are they in the business of, of producing a a vehicle for the consumer that has been typically replaced every every five to seven ten years? Uh, or are they in the business of, just, of only cell production? So they, they produce that they produce that vehicle, but they're not worried so much, or the the, um, uh, the economic benefit for the uh, for the manufacturer is not in the um, uh, in the reproduction of, of that entire uh, vehicle, but simply just flipping it over and replacing it, and then updating componentry as you need to. It is literally potentially a, a plug and play system. But that's Probably separate to, to what council needs are, but yeah, that's, that's where I'm, I'm, I'm guessing it might go. One thing that we were really keen to get a bit of a handle on is they talk about weight reduction in mm -hmm. these vehicles, as in they're very light, um, and um, that seems, and it is great from an economy perspective and getting further for your fuel <coughs> slash battery cell, but. On unsealed roads in regional Queensland, weight is actually the only thing that stops the death rate being 44, not 22. Um, so there'll be a, a you know, and I, look, these are smart people, way cleverer than I am, but you know, it'd be interesting to see do they use a, a ballast, you know, especially fitted ballast. Is that an optional extra for a vehicle if you want to? Um, 
one thing that we did see is it is the the they are already at the point. So these vehicles are that far through their production cycles that they're already recycling batteries. Mm -hmm. And the mm -hmm. batteries that drive the Hyundai vehicle that was there on display was 99% the 99 of the components within that battery are completely yeah. recyclable. Um, and I think, I think they said that there's only a, there's a little, fine gel or something that yeah. they just had a few It's insulation, yeah. insulation yeah. Component that they're looking at the moment and they're changing until they get to 100% yeah. recyclable. Uh, so, uh, so, yeah. So, yes, Council Pond, there was just a little bit that came <laughs> out about <laughs> oh, I'm glad I asked. Please, you asked the question. Thank you. Yeah, um, it was eye opening um, in, in some ways. Freezing cold. Um, absolutely bitter. Well, Entirely unenjoyable. Outside. Outside. Exactly. Not one part of being outdoors in Tasmania excited me any way, shape, or form. Like you would run. I would anyway, from the front door of the accommodation to the taxi or to whatever was taking you wherever you had to go. You wouldn't walk because it was just freezing. Mr. Mayor, I did say it was lovely, but I have to admit that the director of works and I end up with the flu out of it. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And I did not, so therefore the running and staying warm was a very good idea. Yeah, I Okay. All right. Um, any further questions uh, for my report? No. There being none, can I have somebody move uh, trains report? Excuse received? me, Mr. Mayor, we just need a vote. Oh, we need a vote. Those in favour of my report being received, 7 0. Can I have somebody move Shane's report, please? Council of People, second of the plan. Those in favour, 7 0. Okay, Council, mine's not as exciting as the Mayor's, but I'll see what I can do. Um, yeah, it's been a fairly busy month as well. The nursing agreement, um, we've reached out to health now, it's just getting us together to sign off. Um, we had the changes we've gone, uh, just getting a mutual time to sign up. Um, the Mayor and I visited the CWAC to have a look at all the good work they're doing in town. We did a, a side visit. Um, we have the names called the Red Shed. Yep. The Red Shed and um, the artwork on the old squash courts and what they're doing internally. Mm -hmm. Very interesting and the good work they do. Somewhat quiet and um, they don't self promote, but they do a lot of really good um, community work. Um, I think they should be congratulated on that. Um, a certified agreement, staff voted on that. It's now being finalised to send off to the Commission for ratification. So it's, it's been a good outcome for all. Um, went out to Aramac for the loud shirt, no health. I thought my shirt was pretty loud. Um, this isn't a contradiction, but I'm a lightweight when it comes to loud shirts. Um, I was by far the most conservative compared to what they were wearing out there. Uh, it was a great moment to take. Um, yeah, we've had Angela leave, so we're splitting those jobs amongst staff to all the um, analyse and look to go to the market. Um, the LGAQ conference, Councillor Gleeson and Councillor Rogers struck gold and got to travel with me for a road trip. Um, from my perspective, the LGAQ conference was very interesting. A lot of the, the speakers and a lot of the discussions we had were very relevant to what we experienced here, so I thought we had you know, some great opportunities to, to network. I think councillors can speak to that if they want to speak to that. But um, there's some very interesting discussions. Um, the mayor was there as well. Um, we did a lot of work just recently. We went out to Aramac for the Harry Redford Committee establishment, had a bit of discussion where we we'll worked together as a council and committee to, to look at getting that up and running. I thought that was a, a good round table discussion. Um, Paula and the staff and the community are all keen to, to see where that can get to. A um, bit of work on the Outback Tourism Resilience Platform that you'll see there. That was a group talking about how we form in, from our tourism perspective, under the circumstances of an event, cyclone, um, climate change impact. So there was discussions across the, the state about how we manage that as a group. Um, leading Central West Sponsors Dinner. That was a leadership program that was running town through Alley. I went out to the, the dinner that Friday night. 
um, interesting. A lot of people, and Councillor Rogers were there, and so was Jenny. Um, <coughs> learning or understanding different characteristics and types of leadership. I saw some of our own people there who probably didn't realise how important it is to understand that leadership um, mentality will change. Councillor Rogers would probably agree with that. It's, um, it's learning how we react ourselves before we understand how other people react. So I saw some positive round the table discussions. I thought Nellie did a good job presenting and her other presenters. Um, rapid meeting, I was um, the Mayor's proxy last meeting, a lot of good discussions around the table there. And the community engagement forums, I really enjoyed the, the road trips, meeting with our community. I thought that was a, a good opportunity for us to get out. And the other one was a meeting with the QRA, looking at some funding, um, which I'll discuss later with the Mayor. Um, there's an opportunity for us to actually put a hand up to get some funding to help with um, QRA and disaster resilience with flooding in our different regions. So, that being said, I'm joining up open for questions. <coughs> Council. Um, three, Mrs. Mayor, did you have another meeting with Harry Red? That was the one we had last week. So we had an initial interest in the last one was yeah. out of there. And it was um, positive? Yeah. Um, yeah, we have to, oh, of course, it's Chalk's real name. Mm -hmm. David's up heading it up. Yeah. And then, Paula and staff are all quite proactive in ideas and, and how we move forward. It's still at early stages, um, but it was a good positive. So it's sort of positive that we're like, obviously it won't, not certain that we'll, we'll have it, but it's looking the way that we'll have it again next year. So no, decision been made? Councillor yeah. Rogers. <laughs> <laughs> they're, uh, they're very keen to run one next year. Yeah. And um, uh, David Hayes, keen, he, he said he's got um, enough people he thinks to, to run uh, a cattle drive on a, uh, a much smaller basis than we used to. Probably about 15 guest rovers, uh, two weeks instead of three. Uh, Going to downsize it a bit so it's not such a, you know, a, an enormous event to try and run. But very keen to probably try and go next year. Uh, looking at insurances and different things like that that we need to have in place if we are going to run next year. Um, but quite possibly, you know, we'll probably have a cattle drive in starting in the second week of May next year. Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, no um, I was just <coughs> the other thing, um, Emma asked about who was taking over the RAF you mentioned it was Adele, but it was taken away. Yeah. Um, just wondering whether she'd um, send any other activity out to the community. Council's question. Council, please. Mr. Mayor, I haven't got a question, but um, just to mention that we, um, Councillor Rogers and I, and yourself, yeah, we were at Cairns. Um, I have never been to one of those conferences before. It was very, very good. Uh, very, yeah, there's lots of things that you can pick up out of it. Um, some good, um, yeah, there's some good speakers. Some, the, um, uh, the voting, the, um, what am I trying to say with the, when we're, with the, um, on the second morning there with the, <coughs> the notice of vote, motions. The notice of motions, yeah, there were some very interesting, very interesting um, conversations there, but um, but now I enjoyed the experience. Thank you very much, and the, and the assistance it was good. For the benefit of those councillors who partook in your workshop and their <coughs> policy, uh, I uh, clearly followed your direction to <coughs> not speak to the motion from Brisbane City Council regarding <coughs> endangered uh, animal listing. So the Mayor was quite happy with uh, the outcome of that vote. But it was, it was, and, and it showed the power of debate. I think multiple times, Councillor Police and Rogers and I said that you could have been, if the vote had been called after a particular speaker, you would have voted the way they had said. But then you heard the next speaker and you can't call. And then you heard the next, like it was, there was well informed, some, some of it was just 
inane, absolute garbage, rubbish that they were talking, but the vast majority of it was was articulate, well thought out, comprehensive debate showing the diversity of issues and approaches by local governments. Um, you, indeed, wasn't just sector like the rural remote fighting, regional fighting, urban. Like in, in some cases, you had two large metropolitan councils on completely opposing points of view on how to proceed with the matter. And you know, it was there was a couple of close votes, but most of it by the end of the debate had resolved itself that there was a clear majority one way or the other, which is which is good for the LGAQ to have a mandate now to prosecute that platform moving forward. What, what made me smile a couple of times, there was a, um, there was a mayor and a, um, a mayor and a deputy mayor or a mayor and a CEO on the same council were not arguing but debating, debating about the, you know, one was a for and one was against and they both were both on the same council. Um, yeah, the deputy mayor and mayor of a close council to us. Yeah. Anyway, that's very unlikely for a CEO to argue with the mayor in a public forum. Yeah. You wouldn't see that too often. Um, no, very interesting, thank you. Further questions? Can I have somebody move with the Chief of Council Information Correspondence 332? Council of People, second to Council Arthur. Those in favour? Carried. Um, if I could just direct uh, your attention, councillors and Shane to item four, uh, and specifically within that will be page 13 of your, no, sorry, 12 of your agenda, the Small Business Friendly Councils Program, Shane. Has yeah. it, have we signed up to that? No, we haven't. Council Laws, would you agree that it would be something positive for the CEO to uh, seek some advice on what that may mean and whether it's a beneficial program for our council. I have been approached by some businesses uh, in this respect and other councils, neighbouring us are proactively engaged in this space. There is a small business commissioner um, whose job it is to work in this small business space. So I've had a discussion with this, it's very keen. Okay. In general, it's how we help our business cut red tape. Um, that's a good program. Um, so, is it a is it a sort of outdoors in front of your business, or is it in? So, sorry, your question was sorry. Well, so okay, the small business friendly councils program is for to, to, to give councils the ability to facilitate small business growth, either through improved and enhanced interaction with the council, or just understanding what government programs are out there, what um, self-help programs are out there. And for those of you who were at uh, last week's <coughs> forum here, you know, and there was a thing, what, what can we do? Where can we as a business go for help? That program is designed to be the doorway for how small businesses can <coughs> seek help. So it does, govern how it will improve the ability for councils and small businesses to interact directly through a procurement basis, but also providing a platform for them to enhance their own, their own footprint in the community. It's not, about create, it's not about councils being a small business, it's about capacity building small businesses that live with or operate in our council area. The state has appointed a commissioner, they called her the Small Business Commissioner, and it's about navigating government programs to help small business. Now, what I'm thinking about, Mr Mayor, is awareness of outdoor trading, and we've got some uh, licences now that you need to do outdoor trading. Right, sorry, different issue. Permits and... Permits and what have you. Yeah. That's sort of what I was... Thinking of the answer. Yep. <coughs> so I'll just see what comes up. Yeah, I, yep. So that's obviously what this is about. I just picked up on that small business friendly councils as part of this, but yes, this this, this is about the outdoor trading more generally. It's not necessarily a small business or a 
Right, like, yeah, that's it's, a, it's a bit streamlining how we encourage um, the red tape production to be part of this and open the door. Mm. And of course, it's not. It's not <coughs> any questions about any more of that correspondence? I would probably just add number five where they mentioned that all the COVID rules were lifted. So it's beneficial. But now we've got a slide. Yeah. We've got a new way, but at this stage, the status quo remains. Can I have somebody move that we receive the planning and development report? Councillor Gleeson, seconded Councillor Plum. Open favour. Carry. <coughs> right. Questions? We have got movement in the area, which is good. We still don't have a lot of, there's not a lot of building activity that all your dollars and cents have come in yet. But, but we are moving a lot of those that are code accessible that come through just for approvals. Just um, the value of work to date with the prior year's comparison table. Is that so real planning provide that, don't they? They actually compile that. Okay. Councillor Boyson. Councillor Boyson. Is it a, I think it's an appropriate time in the planning to ask a question regarding the, um, I was asked the other day where the council are up to, or where were we at, yeah, the council are up to with the zoning of the industrial areas. On the black wall, on the black wall, <coughs> with the rezoning of the of the industrial areas, the person, the business person that asked me was they're waiting, they're waiting to hear back to um, so that they can build on the on their block. Is that the new planning scheme? <coughs> it's to do with the industrial areas. Yeah, the we're not rezoning what? anything that I know. Of. No, it's not. It's, okay. I'd like, like to get some more information. I'll take it on notice. I, I would encourage them to reach out directly to the office here to, because they may have a live application undertaking a material change of use. Material it's change of use, it was. So, I'm sorry, it's not rezoning, material change of use on, on the industrial box. Well, that would be a live assessment process that the town yeah, planners would be proceeding through. Yeah. So. And that would happen either um, the old plan or the new plan. Correct. Yeah. There'd be an assessment being made at the moment mm -hmm. where the assessors. And so have they already launched one? Mm -hmm. They have to launch, pay for it, mm -hmm. and then it'll go through. Oh, I can have a look at it and see whether it's here because it'll be listed. No, I'll, uh, I'll find out a little bit more information. That will be a very long notice. Mm -hmm. okay. If they're waiting for some magical situation to arise where they won't need to launch one, it's not going to happen. The new planning scheme is not going to supersede the requirement for them to need a material change of use. The area will be zoned um, industrial, <coughs> just like it will be in the new planning scheme, but because its prior existing use was not industry associated to what they're doing, the planning scheme law says that they need to launch an MCU. So the new, the new planning scheme won't, to the best of my understanding, absolve them of the need to still lodge an MCU. Now, what it may do, and this would be a question for Kate, um, would be it may change a, a level of assessment. It may go from code to something else. So it may be slightly simpler in terms of what assessment is applied to it, but they'll still need to lodge some form of um, material change of use request. Thank you. But you've got Kate's number, or Tim's. Yeah, I, I would really urge them to reach out because those guys are the experts. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And obviously, Jenny, you process them all here, so if they come to the office here as well, that can someone here could follow up on that. <coughs> yeah, through you, Mr. Mayor, I don't see that there's an MCU there. Like no. For Markham Industrial Zone. So I think I may have hit the nail on the head there. I'd say they're probably holding it, hoping that the new planning scheme delivered it for them. It's just not going to happen. 
Not because we don't want to, just that's just you know, it's the <coughs> It's legislation about that pay rate, so to speak. Uh, Economic Development Report 334. Can we move that, please? Councillor Arthur, seconded Councillor Hanson. Those in favour? 7 0. Support this proposal. It's fairly a self explanatory model's been up We do must have a future visioning workshop ahead of us. Councillors, um, <coughs> uh, on the basis of that's the matter that I'd like to discuss with you relevant to this report that is listed in there is um, sensitive in nature, is that we close the meeting, please. It's the first item in that report that I'd like to give you a briefing on a meeting that the CO and I attended, but it is uh, commercial, uh, due to a commercialised nature of the arrangement. That's section 254, 3J, I think it is. Do I have a motion? Councillor Rogers, second Councillor Hanson. Those in favour? Meeting closed. Okay. 335. I might have somebody moved it. We received the report of 2022-23 operational plan first quarter update. Councillor Peters, second by Councillor Hanson. Those in favour? Seven. Yeah. Set, sorry, I didn't see it. Seven zero. Hello, Shane. So, so Councillor's first quarter, as expected. Um, here we're progressing, so we've just reported on what we said we'd do. I know it's only a fairly brief summary, but you know, we were three months in when we started, so I think um, present as read and then go for questions. Uh, through you, Mr Mayor, um, I don't know whether it's just to, to highlight something, but 1.8 is highlighted. In yellow, I thought I worked out something from. Uh, no, it's highlighted on mine too. Yeah, no, no, I, that's why I just checked with Councillor Plum's printed version. Is that just uh, something yeah. like that? Yeah, we didn't do that eventually. Yeah, we'll probably no, just no, didn't no, take it off. So. No, I, I didn't see that it was a standout item or had a considerable comment against it. Yeah. So, what we were I'm doing. I'm sure the staff think it is. <laughs> so, so what, what we do is we went through it actually and shared it around the site. How are we travelling? What have we delivered? Where are we struggling? And yeah, that would have been highlighted because it's significant to the. Yeah. Oh, Mr. Mayor, I was just unsure whether I had done something with technology and highlighted it and could not do it. <laughs> you can't take the credit for this one. No, no, no. I, I was highlighting my own deficiencies in technology. As we were running through for a discussion. Yeah. Yeah. Let's talk about this one. Let's talk about this one. So we just didn't remove it. So now you know how we're thinking. We're targeting certain areas. I just thought he was looking at all the insects. Being on there from last and all the insects. So generally, first quarter it's hard to hit every mark of what we said we were doing. We're, we're close to hitting what we said we were. Questions? Worry about the quarter two will be more detailed. Quarter three will be significant because that will tie into our budget as well. Silences Gold 336. Can I have somebody move we received the work health, safety and wellness report, Councillor Arthur, second of Council of Peoples. Those in favour? Motion is carried. We probably should have put in yellow at the bit. What's external? I, I know the comment involved these incidents didn't occur in the council. We, we did that. Well, it, we, we said, first thing that I saw. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> 
the last the, month, the first thing that we saw was somebody got killed. Mm -hmm. um, there's some more advice we put out the staff the other day. There was an explosion in swimming pool, mixing of chemicals in a... So our, right. our doing our audits and everything now is, is really relevant because yep. we're picking up chemicals, storage, PPE, the whole lot. So there was a recent explosion at another council pool site where a staff member accidentally mixed the wrong chemicals. So it's just the mixing of the wrong chemicals causes explosions? Yeah, you shouldn't have certain chemicals beside another chemical. Right. If you accidentally put a, an acid into a, another one. And even sometimes uh, the order of dilution, you can pour one chemical into another, but not vice versa. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. Yeah. The so chemical reactions are quite, or can be quite So Certain carbon fibres and, and charcoals and everything else can um, go up <coughs> to the wrong time. Pressure vessels in um, a hot environment so we, we're being very sort of predictable and we're going through all the site, which I showed yesterday with the workplace health and safety external audit, specifically targeting the crucial bits we need to look at. But so. mm -hmm. generally safety was we're proceeding. Rehab is big for us to get people back in the work as quick as they can when they're injured. There. But there's a lot of work to do with cap IOA with accreditation. So we've got our guys working very diligently quickly to get us across the line. Safety's not going and never stops. Most of it's operational. Questions? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, is COVID having as much of an impact as, as previously? We, we seem to have like little mini spikes, I would say, um, in the community, but uh, is that translating it, it into was, the workforce? It was the time we've had a, a bit of a gap for the last probably two months. Yep. Um, however, in saying that, um, this week, on the last week, is probably Triggered, we've had a couple of cases. Yeah. yeah. Um, there's a few cases in town. Yeah. Um, so we've, we've set out new information this point to all staff about our testing, isolation, separation. Um, it's not mandatory yet. Those were talked with the government before, they, yeah. they lifted everything and now it's some cautionary. I'd rather be proactive, so we've yeah. taken that step. So sanitizers, distance. Thank you. Questions further? 337. I think this report speaks for itself. Uh, questions? Um, I, I did not have to do the with the other people here. Yeah, so. No. It's down in budget resource implications, but the council is having worked. I mean, I guess this is um, something for me to speak to. Uh, that position is very beneficial for our local governments, the five of us in this disaster management group. They do a massive volume of the compliance of the um, activation out of hours when our staff aren't available. They are the streamlined coordinator for emergency response between local government and whichever agency they are, the RefidX. Craig's sort of the go-to resource when things like Bunnabarra gets isolated. Um, it, it's, I don't believe warranted that we have a full-time position we could do. Like other local governments such as Central Highlands have uh, 1.2 people full-time in the board. They have one full-time person and one part-time person allocated. Um, I, I think the, the resource being shared makes the most sense because collectively we've all got enough work full-time for that person, but individually we just don't. Um, he's very, this particular individual is very well experienced now in our LDMG and in our, just generally in our area. Um, during, to give you an example, during the uh, crisis with uh, uh, a restoration <coughs> company um, going into receivership with no notice, um, Craig was one of the people that we at the LDMG lent, lent, lent on to ensure solutions were worked out for a number of our grocery shops um, to try and get things going. So he was the 
is kind of like the resource tool for everything from road closures to mobile phone outages to running out of food to... Uh, it's disappointing the role's not funded. Um, surprising that it's taken this long for them to not fund it. Um, and definitely don't think we can do it without the resource. So, no, I, I agree, Mr. Mayor, and I think we've got a little bit complacent over the last eight or ten years because it's been pretty dry and we haven't had to deal with too many disasters. But I think with everything full, as we, <coughs> you know, we get a proper week <coughs> season, and you just got to have a look at what's been experienced in New South Wales. But, but no, I think it's pretty important too. Yeah, and the, the, the drought has this position it has used the drought to actually get a lot of our policies and procedures and knowledge base up to scratch. We've completely written our local disaster management plan in this time. Um, yeah, good, just really strongly encourage council to endorse this. <coughs> Do I have a move? Councillor Plum, second Councillor Arthur, debate. Being none, I'll put it to the vote. Those in favour, seven zero. 341 financial report. Can I have somebody please move that we receive that report? <coughs> Councillor People, second of Councillor Plum. Those in favour? Carry 7 0. Sarman. It should be time because they lost the final. Ah, I was going to wait till morning tea. <laughs> I'm sorry. You just had to bring it up. You want to put that in confidence? No, <laughs> definitely not. At least I made the final. <laughs> exactly. That was some job to come back in a sense. Um, yeah, Summit, do you have anything you'd like to draw your attention to before I open the questions? Yes, yes Mr. Mayor. Uh, one thing, we missed the rates uh, from the actual agenda, that's why I thought of those printouts. Uh, and the second thing we've added. Uh, main road contracts and uh, to to present in a way that how how we're rolling with the claims and unclaimed and what's the actual project and how much we've been spending on that. It's, it's, a, it's a new item. It, it can be um, made better with time, but at this stage, Mr. Mayor, did a did analysis on that and looked at how it's been done externally and then with the help of Chris and our uh, director of work and the, we've developed this for this meeting. Can I commend you for uh, that um, that contract report there? Uh, that's the best snapshot I've seen in terms of our sales revenue uh, ever. That some <coughs> one table, the value of the contracts that we have signed, um, which I've also personally never seen, and secondly, what we've already spent, how much of what we've spent has been claimed, and by claimed, I assume you mean receipted, so it's yes. it's actually in our bank, yeah. and and what work is still to be, or what dollar value is still to be received. That you know is, you know, I guess the only other thing that if you want to see some. What more can we add to it would be our RMPC contract. You know, sure. what, yeah. what value of yeah. RMPC work has, what the contract value for the year is, which obviously you know, how much of that has been done year to date, and how much of that has been claimed, because that doesn't always, but, but I'm not in any way, I'm over the moon with this report, because this shows us very clearly what money has already gone out the door, how much of it's due to come back, how much has come back, how much is due to come back, um, rather than just being a note down underneath the, uh, the total cash figure, it's a very detailed summary and it's broken up not by aggregation but by individual contract. I think it's going to be committed. It, is a, it may seem simple, but I'm assured that there'd be a fair degree of work that has to go into compiling that. So, well done. Thank you. And the other thing, Mr. Mayor, these, these contract values are not within one year. Like, uh, yeah. Like the project CN 16035. Yeah, that one, that one is flowing from last three years. So the claims that have been received are not only for this year; they've been for 
previous years too. Most of it is from previous year. But because of the, so this is solely capturing the nature of the GMR projects that what can contract and how much work has been done. So the unclaimed figure, uh, I mean, is it as simple in our minds of saying, well, that's as good as cash at bank? May I? Yes, Sorry, through yeah. Mr. Mayor. So Sun and I have been, been talking about this and yeah, there is certainly some, some information that we can improve on uh, for, for, for further reporting periods. Um, what we're, we're seeing there doesn't incorporate any variation, either positive or negative, or how that relates to uh, unclaimed work. So if you're looking at this as expenditure and claimed, um, they are, as is, no interpretation required there. Yeah. Uh, what is in, excuse me, <coughs> what isn't explained in the unclaimed um, may be either positive or negative variations to individual contracts and how they're represented, but we will flesh those out. Um, but um, look, we're also expecting some substantial updates um, over the next month uh, into, into what those figures are going to look like as well. Um, just obviously need to remember that um, the inclusion of that information um, can appear a little muddled and uh, I'd always encourage uh, any questions when, when we're having a look at that. Um, how we go into explaining that uh, in, a, uh, in, a, in a spreadsheet style format um, we'll continue to work on. Um, but um, uh, yeah, I, I take the point that the unclaimed aspect at the moment, although it looks as, as though it's a, a, a case of making a particular claim until we recognise what variations in the negative or positive go against that contract value, um, that doesn't actually uh, reflect uh, as, as clearly as what it is stated, stated there at the moment. Does that make sense? Mm. Yep, no, that, that was the question I was asking. Like, is it, it's, so it's not, don't, I just wanted to, to, don't just in your mind instantly assume that because it's unclaimed it will be paid as is written there. There could be correct. positive or negative movements yeah. with yeah. that. Yeah, yeah that's, that's correct. The yeah. other point that I think that, that I like to see here is that whether you include or don't include the pavement material, um, there's either roughly 11 and a half or 14 million dollars worth of construction work being undertaken as we speak by council. That's a substantial body of construction work. So if you include it, because we actually have to lay that pavement, it's, you know, that's our yeah. job. Um, but it is a significant, it's two and a half million dollars worth of, um, it's two and a half million dollars worth of yeah. effectively just procurement, but it still comes through our system, out of the back of our trucks, um, but it's folded into the three contracts above it. Um, that's with all of the other works that we undertake, are required to undertake, that's a very substantial body of work. And as Sam had said, it's not all in one year, I, I get that, but it's their, their live contracts that our guys are working, and sorry, that our staff, Councillor Arthur, are working on. Um, uh, and meeting up targets and meeting deadlines and, and, you know, complying with project acquittal time frames. It's, you know, for a small regional council um, undertaking significant construction work like that, I think the, the workforce should be commended um, for delivering on budget, on time, substantial construction pro programs. Mr. Mayor, can I just ask Sam Mayor, who's the bottom line, the last one, sorry, the, the, the last project? Yeah, yeah, it's, so, I haven't, we, when we work this out, this is an extensive, but I have to summarize it in some way because there's some external and some overheads go into when they claim the money. That's why the the expenditure I have is of what I have in my GL at this moment, yeah. which I'll try to reform it with how overheads and all those stuff go in and then they claim the money. So, yeah. so the last line, uh, the amount they Yes, to be, be maybe work more on that and could be it could be 
If playing in the unclaimed is going to be more than your contract value, but is that yeah, the sorry, yeah, very interesting. Now, yeah, oh, look, oh, sorry, uh, Simon, is that the claim to an expenditure just on that last line? Do they need to be flipped around there? See, the mechanism. Okay. Yeah, okay. yeah. yeah, there's a mechanism how it works, Mr. Mayor, okay. and that is that whatever the direct expenditure is, then some overheads are taken into account when they put the claim in. Okay. So that covers that 400k somewhere. We, we might actually expand on that for the next meeting. And we can even do that by the way to make clear all the work. Um, further questions? <coughs> um, so thank you, um, and we really appreciate that, as I said before. Uh, further questions on other elements of the uh, financial report? Uh, through you. Mr. Mayor, um, even taking on board the comments from our Director of Works, even if we do, were to say 75% of that unclaimed, or if we looked at, say, $2 million for 1.5, <clears throat> if that was in our bank, we would be closer to that uh, five months of sustainability. Between four and five. Yeah, but yeah. Mr. Mayor, keeping in mind that these projects can be claimed at a certain stage of their progress too. Yep. That's what the directly yep. boards would agree. So yep. we'll, we will have to add some commentary there that how much percentage or something like that to explain yep. it more better that where that claim would be or is it to be claimed yet or not. Yep. The other thing. Because that, yeah, it's just and, yeah. And, and so realistically further to that we're probably sitting at even though the report says we've got three months. Realistically, we're probably four months. Three, three months, months solid upside. Yeah. 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 No, that's right. Thank you. Yeah. Mr. Nick, can I just ask something? Um, with the back called an Aramac Road there, um, and hopefully it's going to be completed by December, um, is that all to do with that area that we're doing now? So. No. No? There's another job. There is, but that's. No, oh, not there. that's not there. No. Oh, okay. No. I just wondered. You know, so the next, next completion, it would be. Yeah, the next next part's tits, which goes from approximately that change back to the grid, oh, yeah. where the road starts to widen again past the turn off onto politics. Politic. Yeah. 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 That's all right. I just wondered. You know, like that's near completion, so that maybe that's another claim we're going to get there. Finish that work. Right, the next job is not listed because it hasn't started yet. Oh, yeah. Okay. Thank you. I think, um, yeah, I, I, that was kind of the point I was making about <coughs> what back all out of that, Councillor Arthur. I, the good thing I like about that sustainability <coughs> graph, even though, yes, we have dipped from our highs of five, the trend over the preceding, over the last. Um, 12 months has elevated and is sort of flatlining a month or so, a month to six weeks, better than we were tracking 12, 18 months prior to today. So we're just we're starting to just develop that little bit of a buffer or increase that buffer slightly. And one thing that will be a substantial help will be when we receive the final half of our FAGS payment, which we haven't got yet which will be about, under the new methodology, we should be due to receive about $5 million, is that right? We'll say 4.5 up front, is that right? Six, <coughs> sorry, so it'll be four million. So there's a $4 million. So if we're, if we're holding cash at that 15, 15 and a half, if we can keep it north of 15 or thereabouts, and then as the final fag plane it drops in, then, you know, that, that jumps us straight up. We've only just received most of our half year rates. So we've still got half year rates and four million in bags still to till still to be received. We've still got two very significant revenue periods uh, this financial year yet to be realised. And an ongoing ongoing uh, construction offsetting a significant portion of our wage bill. I'd much sooner be in the position we are with the fiscal outlook we have today than the one that we had two years ago when we came to office. 
Yeah, yeah. Other questions? Okay, then none. We'll adjourn for morning tea.